Hello, everybody. I am John Allen, and this is Last Week in the Church. This is the show where we sort through the flotsam and jetsam, the avalanche, the torrent, the outpouring, the Vesuvius of the last week on the Vatican and the Catholic Church beat, and try to extract those few nuggets of wisdom that you just absolutely cannot live without. And here's what we've got for you this week. So, we begin with I Did It My Way, how a new appointment to Lisbon this past week by Pope Francis illustrates, well, a couple of things. One is that this pope simply never has been and never will be a captive to ecclesiastical custom. And secondly, how he may be redefining the office of cardinal in the Catholic Church. We will unpack all of that. Second, we are vast, we contain multitudes. How an Italian cardinal's message for the funeral of a well-known and deeply controversial Italian writer illustrates the true universality of the Catholic Church. Third, just when I thought I was out, they pull me back in. How a new church in southern Italy dedicated to two anti-mafia martyrs represents another watershed in the emergence of the Catholic Church as perhaps the most vociferous anti-mafia force in contemporary Italian society. Fourth, prophets and prophets. How the unexpected death at 62 of a former administrator of a papally owned pediatric hospital reflects the ambiguities of Vatican justice. And then finally, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. How, after a period of silence, German Archbishop Georg Gainswein has reemerged in the public eye, what that might suggest about his role going forward and the perplexities that might create for the Francis papacy. All that and more is waiting for you on this edition of Last Week in the Church, so please, for the love of God, stay where you are. And it's true confessions time. I'm going to admit to you that when it comes to 21st century high technology, I'm not really your guy. I mean, to be honest with you, I think social media is basically a work of the devil, and I'm not entirely kidding about that. I don't have accounts on Instagram or TikTok or LinkedIn or any of these other things that you're supposed to have, and I don't even know what any of those things mean. When it comes to artificial intelligence, I don't really get what the buzz is about, because frankly, whatever intelligence I possess has been artificial for a very long time. However, I like to think that what I lack in tech savvy, I can make up for in judgments about people. And so when people I respect, people I admire, people I trust, tell me that a particular piece of technology is valuable, I listen to them. And that brings us, by a roundabout fashion, to a new technological platform called Magisterium AI that has been launched by our friends at Longbeard. Longbeard is a digital strategy and design company. They are the backbone of the technological dimension of Crux. Basically speaking, everything about how the Crux site operates, everything you see, when you come to the correct site is because of them. Frankly, my show last week in the church is because of them. The CEO of Longbeard, Matthew Sanders, once came to me and said, you know, I think we could do something with a weekly video and podcast. And I was dumb enough to listen to him, and here we are. Now, Longbeard has put out this new tool which harnesses the power of artificial intelligence to the magisterium of the Catholic Church. So you can go on their site and type in, what does the Catholic Church teach on abortion? Or why do we have to go to Mass? Or could you please write a homily for me for the Feast of Christ the King? Whatever. And based upon this tool's exposure to official documents of the Catholic Church, it will spit out a response. And it will also give you citations. So if you want to check to make sure that it's legit, you'll have the tools to do that. It is one of the more creative, useful, hopeful, and I think positive applications of AI technology in the Catholic sphere anyone to date has come up with. So I encourage you to check it out. You can find it online at magisterium.com. Again, that is magisterium.com.
look, like I say, I am not a tech guy, but even I would use this tool, and I promise you, if I'm open to it, if I see some value to it, then that special Luddite in your life will too. Check it out, Magisterium AI. All right, everybody, happy Tuesday to you. Happy Tuesday, August 15th, wherever you are. Therefore, happy Feast of the Assumption, which is today's feast on the Catholic calendar. If you are in Italy, Buon Ferragosto. Happy holiday of Ferragosto. Ferragosto is the traditional mid-August holiday here in Italy. It is a contraction of the words Ferrie Augusto, that is the holidays of the Emperor Augustus, dates back to ancient Rome. It is basically a time when absolutely everything in Italy shuts down. There are many differences between Italy and the United States. Here's one. In the United States, we stagger our vacations, right? So some people take their vacations in the summer. Some take them in the spring. Some in the fall, some in the winter, and on and on. In Italy, absolutely everyone takes their vacations at the same time, which is right now in the middle of August. In fact, my wife Elise and I, who was shooting this video, we are probably the only two people in the city of Rome who are actually working right now, except for the people who serve the tourist industry. And that, ladies and gentlemen, should be the last full measure of our devotion to this beat and to this story. All right, we begin this week as I teased at the top with I did it my way. Now that, of course, is a reference to Frank Sinatra, but in this case, it is actually Pope Francis, who from the very beginning has carved out a reputation as a maverick, right? A guy who doesn't necessarily obey tradition, doesn't do things the way they've always been done. And so this past week, we got another example of this maverick streak of Pope Francis when he appointed a new archbishop patriarch in Lisbon. This, of course, right after he was in Lisbon, August 2nd to the 6th for World Youth Day. Everyone understood that this would probably be Patriarch Manuel Raul Clemente's swan song. And in fact, that's how it turned out. Shortly after the Pope got back to Rome, he named a new guy in Lisbon, who is currently a bishop. By virtue of the appointment, he becomes the Archbishop Patriarch of the capital city of Portugal. Now, in a sense, nothing unusual about that, right? Well, the unusual thing is there is an auxiliary bishop in Lisbon by the name of Americo Aguiar, who has been announced will be made a cardinal by Pope Francis when he holds his next consistory, that is the event in which new cardinals are created, on September 30th. So, in other words, the new Archbishop of Lisbon will take office with one of his deputies, that is a guy who technically works for him, who actually outranks him in terms of the ecclesiastical hierarchy, right? In other words, you're going to have a cardinal reporting to an archbishop. By any traditional standard, this is a kind of deeply weird development. Now, how do we explain it? Well, on the one hand, I think we can begin with Pope Francis, and I say this with love and respect. I don't mean this to be pejorative, but Pope Francis is a stubborn dude. And the more you tell him he can't do something, the more likely he is to do precisely that thing, okay? So part of this is just Francis, you know, being determined to do things his own way. Second, there are also rumors that Pope Francis may be preparing to bring Cardinal-designate Aguiar to Rome for some major gig here in the Vatican. I mean, if that happens, of course, it would solve the problem. But I want to suggest there may be actually a third thing going on here which is a redefinition of what it means to be a cardinal in the Pope Francis era. You know, in the old days, we called cardinals princes of the church, right? And what we meant by that was that these are people who occupy the highest rungs on the ecclesiastical ladder. In other words, they have jobs that sort of demand the recognition of being a cardinal. So, if you were the head of a department in the Vatican, you know, an important department in the Vatican, like, you know, in the old days, the Congregation for Bishops or the Secretariat of State or the Congregation for Clergy, then that automatically meant 
that you were going to become a cardinal. Or if you led a major archdiocese around the world, right? So if you were the Archbishop of London, or of Paris, or of Milan, or of Prague, or of New York, or Los Angeles, or Toronto, or Sydney, in other words, the great cities of the world, right? the understanding was that that almost automatically meant that you were going to become a cardinal. And that's what we meant by princes of the church. These are the people who hold the most important positions in the church. Now, in the Pope Francis era, I would suggest to you that what we were seeing is that cardinals are no longer princes of the church. They are princes of the pope. That is, they are the pope's most trusted sort of lieutenants, advisors, allies doesn't necessarily mean they hold the most important jobs. Like right now, for instance, there is an archbishop in Milan who has been passed over repeatedly to become a cardinal. There's an archbishop in Los Angeles who has been passed over repeatedly to become a cardinal. There is an archbishop in Sydney who has been passed over repeatedly to become a cardinal. The new archbishop in Toronto is not being made a cardinal. Now, you know, what does all that mean? It doesn't mean those jobs are unimportant. It doesn't mean they've been downgraded. It just means Pope Francis has a different model of what it means to become a cardinal. It doesn't mean that the job you have, the, re the particular responsibility with which you have been entrusted is more important than others. What it means is that your personal relationship to this pope is more important. That is that you have been designated as one of the carriers, one of the the exponents, right, of this pope's particular ecclesiastical vision and agenda. In other words, we're watching a transition from princes of the church to princes of the pope. And if you want a place where that is more clear in all of its debated glory than any place else on the planet, I would suggest to you Lisbon is it. All right, second up this week. We are vast, we contain multitudes. So this week, Italy has been marking the loss of a very well-known writer and public figure by the name of Michela Murgia. She died from cancer at 51, obviously incredibly young. But already at the age of 51, she was one of the most celebrated, I guess you would call it public intellectuals in Italy. She was a novelist, she was an essayist, a frequent commentator, on public affairs. She was known as an ardent feminist, an advocate for LGBTQ plus rights, a proponent of euthanasia, basically a carrier of what you would consider to be a kind of, you know, for lack of a better word, sort of leftist or progressive social agenda. So when she died, Italian Cardinal Matteo Zuppi, who was the president of the Italian Bishops Conference, he is also, of course, Pope Francis's special envoy in Ukraine and Russia. He, a longtime member of the community of Sant'Egidio, this new movement in the Catholic Church born after Vatican II that is dedicated to ecumenism, interfaith relations, conflict resolution, and other good causes. Zuppi, who had been a personal friend of Michaela Morgia, sent a message for her funeral basically saying that until the very end, Murgia had, dev had devoted her life to service and concern for other people. And, and Zuppi called that the secret of love, il segreto di amore, and said, look, there are things you could discuss, you know, I don't necessarily agree with everything that Murgia stood for. But he said, this is a person who poured herself out in service and love for others, and he offered the prayer that now she will know the fullness of God's love in the life that is to come. Now, you know what this reminded me of? In 2006, another celebrated female Italian writer and public intellectual by the name of Orniana Falacci died. Orniana Falacci, whatever Mergia was to the left, Falacci was to the right, okay? She was a deep, profound, anti-Islamic hawk, you know, she wrote a famous book called The Rage and the Pride about how Europe needed to wake up and defend its civilization against the onslaught of the Islamic hordes, right? Now, she had a very good friend in the Catholic hierarchy by the name of Archbishop Reno Fisichella. 
who currently runs the Vatican's Dicastery for Evangelization and has been around a long time, was formerly the ch chaplain to the Italian parliament. Now, Falacci, despite the fact that she wanted to defend the Catholic identity of Italy, was an atheist, publicly proclaimed as an atheist, rejected belief in God. Yet, at the time of her death, Fisichella sent a message for her funeral, saying that even though she called herself an atheist, he said there still were vestigial elements of Christian faith in her life, in her heart, and said that he was going to be praying that she found the fullness of the love of God in the life that is to come. Now, here's the thing, folks. Take these two situations. Cardinal Zuppi sending this message for the death of Michaela Murgia and Archbishop Fisichella sending this message at the death of or Orniana Falacci several years ago. In a way, there is nothing particularly surprising, right, about a church that defends traditional faith and values, sympathizing with the death of a conservative. And there is nothing, I suppose, particularly surprising about a church that emphasizes social justice and peace and tolerance and all that. You know, like, a, for instance, a mainline Protestant denomination sympathizing with the death of a political progressive. What is unique about the Catholic Church is that we can do both, right? The Catholic Church embraces all of these points of the compass and many more beyond that. Look, if you want to look at Catholicism from a strictly partisan point of view, where you think the whole point is for one side to defeat the other, then maybe this is all puzzling. But if you look at the Catholic Church as the sacrament of the universality of the human race, right, where our mission is to embrace, well, you know, as Paul VI famously said, nothing human is alien to us. If that is our mission, then the fact that we have hierarchs who were able to reach out and dialogue in a spirit of love with two people who represent such opposite points of the compass, that has to be one of the glories of the Catholic Church. That's how I would choose, anyway, to look at all of this. Again, to paraphrase Walt, Walt Whitman, do I contradict myself? Very well. I contradict myself. I am vast. I contain multitudes. All right. Third up this week, we've got just when I thought I was out. They pull me back in. Famous line from Godfather 3, of course, in this case. It has to do with the Catholic Church's historically somewhat ambivalent, but recently quite confrontational relationship with the mafia, especially here in Italy. This week, the bishop of the diocese of Cefalù, which is in Sicily, it is a small diocese located near the city of Palermo, announced that a new parish is being opened which is going to be dedicated to two of the premier anti-mafia patrons, martyrs, in Italian Catholicism, Blessed Rosario Livantino and Blessed Pino Pugliese. Rosario Livantino was a layman, a, a magistrate, that is a kind of prosecuting judge in the Italian system, who was well known for his prosecutions in Sicily of mafia figures, Pino Pugliese was a priest in the tough Palermo neighborhood of Brancaccio who was known for rescuing young people from the mafia and giving them some other purpose in their life. Both of them were assassinated by the mob for their troubles. Rosentino was killed in 1990, Pugliese in 1993. They've both since been beatified. They are both examples of an expanded concept of martyrdom in the Catholic Church. This was formally ratified by Pope Francis in 2017, who created a new category of martyrs, not who were killed in odium fidei, that is, in explicit hatred of the faith, but rather for what he called the heroic offering of life. And both Rosentino and Pugliese were kind of forerunners of that explicit recognition. And all of this builds on what has been a dramatic transition in the Catholic Church over the last, say, 30 or 40 years in terms of its attitude towards the Mafia. Historically, particularly in southern Italy, the Catholic Church was often criticized for being somewhat soft on the mob. That is, you know, bishops would take money from mob bosses. Mob figures would participate in religious processions, and so on. Now, let me be clear. 
There is a history there that Americans often don't appreciate. And let me try to bottom line it for you. It's not just that the mob bought off these bishops and clergy. In the 19th century, Southern Italy was basically forcibly united to the new Italian Republic. The Kingdom of the Two Sicilies in Southern Italy, which was Catholic to the core and devoted to the cause of the Pope, was wiped out by an offensive from the Italian North that puts Sherman's March to the Sea in the United States to shame. It makes that look like a walk in the park compared to what happened in Southern Italy. And you had these armed groups of what were known here as the Briganti, the brigands, who went out into the forest, who were soldiers of that old kingdom or in who were loyal to the Pope, who tried to fight on to continue the fight. And to do that, they began to rob and steal, not so much from local folks, but from these armies of the North. They were the forerunners of what we consider today the mob. So you have to remember that this alleged softness of the Catholic Church with regard to the mafia originated as a kind of embrace of these figures who were considered heroes in Southern Italy because they were defending a Catholic monarchy and they were defending the Pope. Now, of course, what happened over the intervening decades is that whatever the original idea of these groups of brigands may have been, they morphed into just, you know, a toxic form of organized crime. And belatedly, that was finally recognized by John Paul II in 1993 when he went to Sicily. He met with Rosario Leventino's parents and afterwards, extemporaneously, called on the church to rise up as one and to resist the mafia. And the creation of this new church is the latest step in that evolution. My point here simply is that, okay, maybe it took the church, particularly in Italy, more time than it should have to reach this realization. But on the other hand, it is also a lesson in how it is very difficult to make judgments about what happened in a particular part of the world if you don't actually appreciate the history and the culture of that place. Judging from the outside, ladies and gentlemen, without walking a mile in the shoes of these folks is always a hazardous enterprise. Fourth up this week, we have of prophets and prophets. So this week, at the age of 62, an Italian layman by the name of Giuseppe Profitti, his last name is the Italian word for profits, P-R-O-F-I-T-S, that is money you make from doing something. Profitti died. He was a veteran administrator of public health systems in Italy. His last gig was overseeing the public health system in his native region of Calabria in southern Italy, but he is best known for the period of time from in, well, essentially 2008 to 2015, when he was the head of the Bambino Gesù, that is the papally sponsored, very famous pediatric hospital here in Rome. And at the end of his tenure, Profiti was charged with financial crime, that is embezzlement and misappropriation, and subjected to a trial by a Vatican tribunal as a kind of an initial demonstration in the Pope Francis era of this new spirit of transparency and accountability. What he was charged with was misappropriating roughly a half million dollars, that is about, oh, you know, 400 and some, 460,000 dollars from the Bambino Gesù Foundation bank account to help rehab, that is remodel, an apartment for Italian Cardinal Tarsicio Bertone, who had been the Secretary of State under Pope Benedict XVI. And basically what Bertone, when he got his new apartment after he left the Secretary of State's job, it needed some remodeling. He went to Profiti, who was a friend of his from the Italian city of Genoa, and said, look, if you help pay for the remodeling, then you can use this space for fundraising events for the Bambino Gesù. Now, you got to understand, this apartment has a beautiful terrace. It has a knockout view of St. Peter's Basilica. It's right next door. It's right next to the Casa Santa Marta, where Pope Francis lives. I mean, it is primo real estate. And so Profiti, being a smart businessman, realized immediately that, yeah, if we were to stage fundraising events there, maybe once or twice a year, 
in a matter of just two or three years, we would probably make back everything we spend on this and more and be able to help subsidize the operating expenses of the hospital. So he agreed. Later, however, in the Pope Francis era, it was seen as poor form to be staging events like that. And so Perfitti was charged with a crime. Now, the thing about this is, like the architect of this affair was not Giuseppe Perfitti, it was Tarsisio Bertoni, Cardinal Bertoni. However, not only was Bertoni not indicted, he wasn't even called to testify. So the takeaway for most people was this was a pretty clear case of the Vatican serving up a scapegoat in the person of Giuseppe Profitti in order to insulate a higher up in the system, i.e. a former Cardinal Secretary of State, from direct culpability. Proof of the point is that after Profitti was found guilty by this Vatican Tribunal, you know, normally, if you are found guilty of, you know, of a financial crime, you're not going to be able to get another gig. This guy was snapped up immediately to run one of the major cardiatric care centers in Italy. Then he got an offer to run the public health system up in northern Italy and instead took this gig in southern Italy. Point is, nobody thought he'd actually done anything wrong. They thought that, you know, he was basically a stalking horse for the sins of others. And in fact, when he died this week, one of the big Italian newspapers, their headline of his obituary was, a brilliant healthcare administrator dies who had the bad luck to work for the Vatican. Look, guys, there is a history here in the Vatican. We bring in talented lay people, we exploit them, we underpay them, we overwork them, and then when anything goes wrong, we make them the scapegoats and we insulate the higher-ups in the system from any kind of liability or accountability. Giuseppe Profitti is one among many examples of that ambiguity in the Vatican justice system. And it's well known, of course, because there is another trial for financial crime going on right now, which is supposed to be reaching a verdict by the end of the year. We will see whether that looks like another case in point or whether a new day genuinely has dawned. Finally, this week, Keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. So Archbishop, German Archbishop Georg Gainswein, who was the doyen, the private secretary to Pope Benedict XVI, and who got in a lot of hot water for publishing a book and giving a lot of media interviews around the death of his mentor, in which he exposed some of the tensions between Pope Francis and Pope Benedict, and between, you know, really the followers of Pope Francis and the followers of Pope Benedict. He was recently sent packing by Pope Francis back to his home diocese of Freiburg in Germany without any gig. He had kind of, for a while, remained fairly quiet after that denouement. But this past week, he was back in the public spotlight because the German edition of his book, Nothing But the Truth, about his years with Pope Benedict, has appeared. And so he is now traveling around Germany, giving talks to promote the release of this book. He was recently in Bavaria where he choked, look, I am basically unemployed and said, maybe I need to, I need to contact an employment agency to try to get me a gig. You know, revealed that he is currently living in the seminary in Freiburg and has a kind of understanding with a local bishop that he can say mass and, you know, do confirmations. But other than that, not really clear what he is supposed to be doing. But nevertheless, he has emerged from his self-imposed isolation. And in fact, next Sun for today, actually, on the 15th, is going to be celebrating a major public mass in Bavaria for the Feast of the Assumption. Now, what does all this illustrate about his role? Well, what it indicates is that Gainswine, he's not going to go nuclear, but he also does not appear to be inclined to go quietly into that good night. He intends to continue to play some public role as the keeper of the flame for the memory and the legacy of Pope Benedict XVI. Now, what this raises really is the question of the wisdom of Pope Francis's strategy here in essentially cutting Gain Swine loose and sending him home without any new assignment. It was widely seen at the time that this was Pope Francis's effort to make clear to Gainswine that he kind of disapproved of the way that Gainswine publicly aired the dirty laundry 
about some of the tensions between the two popes, and not to mention Gainswine's own disappointment over the way that he was treated by Pope Francis. But, you know, at the time, some people wondered, was it really smart to basically make Gainswine a free agent, and would it have been better to give him some kind of job, either in the Vatican or someplace else, where he was still beholden to Pope Francis in some way? That is, you know, part of the Pope's team, and therefore obligated in some ways to try to be a company player, a team player. You know, you can parse that any way you want to, but I think the clear takeaway from Gainswine's most recent sort of public appearances anyway, is that he's not going anywhere, and that he is going to continue to be a kind of public point of reference for the legacy and the memory of Benedict XVI, and therefore a public point of reference for all those who, to some extent, and for various reasons perhaps, are disenchanted with the Francis papacy. Now, you know, perhaps Francis knew that was the price of cutting him loose and was willing to pay it. Perhaps Francis will end up regretting that decision to send him off into kind of independent orbit. But in any event, what we now have is the sort of maverick and odd situation of a formal papal sec- former papal secretary becoming, in effect, the spokesperson for opposition to the current pope. But we end where we started. Pope Francis is a maverick. He does things his own way. And this is, yet again, another case in point. All right, that is our show for this week. You can find full coverage of all these stories on the Crux site. That is CruxNow.com. Once again, CruxNow.com. Thank you for watching. We will be back here next week. Same bat time. Same bat channel with the same incisive, trenchant, and biting insight into contemporary Vatican in Catholic affairs. In the meantime, have a great feast day. Have a great week. Stay safe. Stay healthy. We will talk to you again very soon.